Well, folks, Brandon Chapman with today. It's another edition of Monday video for Theo Trade. It is September 30th, and boy, we are at the end of the quarter. A tumultuous quarter ends, and guess what? We're at new highs, at new high close uh, at 57.62 on the SPX. As we look at the course of the last three months, a uh, long-awaited volatility finally materialized. We had basically, if we look at the, the retracement from the high uh, into the beginning of August, You'll see right here we had a 9.7 per 79.79 percent decline, uh, followed up by another decline from high to low to about uh, almost four and a half percent. We finally got some downside movement. We finally got some volatility. If you look back over the course of the last year, we finally see it. And yet, what the market's back at new highs again. What does this hold? Well, it looked like things were getting tired. I've been looking at the market for the last little while, thinking, hey, this is a major low. Right, we had a 10% decline with a V-shaped recovery. That would make this the mid-cycle dip, and we're heading towards the three-quarter cycle high. <laughs> well, where does this high end? Well, if we look at today, it seemed like it was not willing to give up the ghost. Um, as Powell was speaking, we finally started to see some downside price action. Uh, Powell basically saying, "Yeah, we gave you 50, but maybe we're not prepared to give you 50 every single meeting," as the market's been pricing in. And the market began to sag a little bit. And then around uh, around 1225, my time, this is mountain time, the market began to find its footing and then really kind of ripped into the close. Kind of that window dressing, that end of quarter saying, hey, we're doing good. We're doing well. We are in a bull market. Now, the question is, are we really in a bull market? We've gone through a snare where the Fed has cut 50. They were expected to cut 50 in their November meeting, at least another 50 by December. Well, how have things necessarily changed? Well, if we come in here, we look at the November's expiration. We do see a shift today going from a, basically a 50-50 proposition of 25 or 50. Now we're shifting more back towards a 4.5% to 4 and 3 quarters Fed funds rate, which basically is a quarter point less than where we are right now. So that would be what? 3 quarters point instead of where we were let's say, for example, on uh, Friday at a 53% chance of a 50 basis point cut. So we're seeing a slight shift there as a result of Powell's statement today. Well, then we go to December. Are we taking another 50 off the table? The answer is no. 4% to 4 and a quarter percent is what? 48 or less is basically what about the 63% probability and that's where we're currently at four and three quarters. So we're basically looking at still greater than a 50%, uh, uh, one and a quarter percent, sorry, a 50% probability the Fed cuts one and a quarter percent or more by the end of the year. Has this materially changed? Not exactly. It's shifted maybe by about 12 or 13% from Friday. And if we look at it compared to a week ago, it was about 76%. Right now we're at about 63%. So we did see a slight shift, which makes sense as to why the market may have sold off a little bit when Powell basically said, hey, hold your horses. We may not cut as fast. What proceeded from that point forward was an entirely different story and creates some confusion as to well, what created the drift. Was well, statement was actually hawkish or more hawkish than it was previously. It's hard to say exactly what's creating the lift other than the fact that the market what did get lifted into the close, and maybe there is an opportunity. You'll see the 10-year Treasury yield rising here a little bit. You would have thought that that might have hurt. If we look at uh, interest rate sensitive parts of the market, should maybe hurt real estate. And if we look at XLRE throughout the course of the trading day, did we fade? No, we ripped into the close. So again, it just looks like maybe some real window dressing coming and saying, hey, let's buy this into the close. Very little, uh, very little resistance to that, um, and it just allowed for the market to drift higher. Now we look at after hours here in XLRE, some pressure coming in after hours. But the point is, when we think about is the market in a bull market? Well, if we look at this on a daily basis, you might say, well, yeah, we're we formed a new high here. Back it out to a weekly. We get rid some of the uh, rid of some of the. Uh, um, uh, the noise, low, high, low, high. We have a series of higher highs and higher lows. So I guess if we look at the market in nominal terms, yes, we have a bullish trend. 
But a bullish trend does not necessarily make a bull market. There's other factors fundamentally and otherwise that may come to the fore here. And when I think about the Fed cutting 50 basis points and then maybe cutting another 75 by the end of the year, yeah, we may push out from November to December. But the reality is if we look at the market, strip out the effects of the weak dollar, of which the dollar's been weakening pretty significantly late, let's price it in gold terms. And what I do is just do a composite symbol, and we're going to load a uh, uh, the pairs ratio study set here, and it's just an indicator. And this gives us a chance to look at the S&P 500 in gold terms. We're stripping out the weakness in the dollar. The weak dollar's lifting the S&P higher because the S&P's priced in dollars. Now we've just priced it in gold. Well, what does that mean? Well, look at it. If we look at the current level of the market, yeah, this week so far we're doing well, because gold sold off today, the S&P was a little bit higher by 0.4%. But look at it in context. We're way off the high that we established in early February. In fact, we're at the same level today in real terms. Think of it as the purchasing power of the market. We're at the same purchasing power level we were in 2022. So we're taking risk only to what? Just maintain its purchasing power? Gold has a lot less risk than the S&P 500. And we know that over time, its, its return is slightly negative because you got to store it somewhere. So basically what's happening is we're taking risk in the S&P without establishing or generating any real return since 2022. And boy, when you start to break that out in a longer time frame, max available, we'll go monthly here, you realize that the inflationist agenda of the Federal Reserve has not done a lot to create long-term value for investors. And just so you can see this, the purchasing power of the S&P today is the same as it was back in 1997. How's that for, for, for a point, right? The same purchasing power it had in 2006 or the same purchasing power it had in 2018. The fact of the matter is, is that the purchasing power of the S&P 500 as a whole is not keeping up with inflation or is barely keeping up with inflation. And, and recently, we know that it has not, right? That gold has outperformed this year and since its high in late February. So we can cheer this on and say, great, yes, we're in a bull market. The realities of this is that the mirage of the bull market is what? It's the weak dollar policy of the Federal Reserve. Now, what happened today that is somewhat interesting? Well, gold is down 0.8%. Okay, gold's down 0.8. Well, what does that mean? It means that the dollar strengthened today. We can see that by using, for example, dollar sign DXY. But dollar sign DXY just looks at what? This is just the dollar against what? The euro. So yeah, we saw post Powell testimony, we saw a strong move in the dollar vis-a-vis -vis the euro. 57% of the movement in DXY is because of the euro US dollar relationship. So we saw that all our strength in post Fed makes sense, post Powell, because he was speaking dovishly, right? Or hawkishly. Essentially, what? Saying we're not going to cut as quickly. We saw minimal movement. We saw some movement generating some strength in the dollar, weakness in gold, but the SP finished higher. So normally you'd think, well, hey, if the dollar is going to strengthen, this should place pressure on the S&P 500. So what we got to see is what's going to happen from this point forward. Are we going to continue to see strength in the dollar? In that case, we're probably going to see weakness in the S&P. Maybe we see the dollar's weakness moderate, in which case gold does not perform as well. Well, right now, the last days, gold hasn't done well. It's down a couple of days. In that case, maybe we have somewhat of a reflation trade building where the S&P starts to regain its footing and starts to move and gain in real and nominal terms with the dollar provide, prov helping to provide the nominal boost. We'll have to see here. I mean, it's very difficult because, again, maybe this is just end of uh, end of quarter kind of window dressing here to make things finish on the high side. Liquidity dries up. We start to kick in and we close. But what we know is this is going to be a pretty pivotal time for the market is this part of a longer cycle that's about to roll over, or is this wave extend and continue to move higher uh, on route to 600 before we get to 540 or 500? That is the ultimate question. 
We'll have to see as we start to approach earnings in October, start to get bank earnings and other stuff coming out. Can Are we holding up in this environment? Obviously, we did see weakness a little while ago in J.P. Morgan. Uh, we saw a break back here on the 10th of uh, September. Why? We're talking about write-offs, ally. So we are seeing some stress in the financial space. They're going to be first up in terms of earnings in October coming up in the next couple of weeks. So we'll see. Can they hold up in the face of what's happening economically? Can we come out of it? There's a lot of stuff. Obviously, the hurricane, just, just tumultuous. I mean, just crazy stuff going on in the South. Feel terrible for those people that are lost their homes during the, due to flooding, et cetera, a storm surge, whatever it was that affected that particular region. I hope things come out favorably for them more quickly. They can find footing and find a place to live. Um, but the reality is, again, that should create a drag, right? We have and we have an election coming up with tremendous potential for volatility, a geopolitical conflict, all this stuff heating up at the same time as we're hitting October. September is usually the the bearish month, and we did see volatility rear its head in uh, in August. We'll see whether or not we see a, pro, a pre-election swoon in the market. Do we start to succumb? I'm not sure what the answer is. We definitely know what the answer right now is in China. As we look at China step up their inflationary tactics, we've seen a huge boost in FXI, KWeb, right? Uh, ASHR. We saw in the last week significant option activity. And so in my daily sessions uh, since uh, um, not this last Friday, but the Friday before the last little over a week, we've been riding these trends in stocks like NEO, for example. Um, look at NEO today, huge gap up. So we had the spread down here. One of the money, we talked about rolling it. We said, hey, if we can get north of seven, roll to seven or eight, gaps up and the door is closed on it. Interesting, isn't it? I mean, are we seeing the China trade fade here for a moment? Well, today we saw bullish option activity in ASHR, for example, another Chinese ETF, the Nove 32, 34, taking upside shots. The great thing about these products and also KWeb, the great things about these products is that they're fairly cheap. What does that mean? It means that the volatility skew is skewed more positively. This is actually going to, this uh, is probably anomalous here in KWeb, but you'll see rising volatilities move out. You can buy lower, sell higher. Uh, significant volatility skew means these spreads are really cheap to speculate by buying call spreads in this stuff, whether it's KWeb, ASHR. Uh, we did some trades in Leaf, for example. Uh, Liato, XPEV over the past week that have played out pretty well. But today we finally started the luster come off it. If the dollar strengthens, this may limit some of the movement and opportunity in Chinese stocks. But again, seeing a bullish trade in ASHR and KWeb today certainly helping kind of keep that attitude. But again, Powell did change things a little bit in his statement today that allowed for the dollar to strengthen, goal to weaken, uh, these Chinese uh, um, ETFs and stocks were fading early off of that gap. This is why you take advantage. When you have a call spread, you get a big move, you roll it, take something out of it. Um, you know, again, these are ones we've kind of looked at rolling a couple times over the last week because of the profound movement that we've seen. Uh, but again, eventually, as you keep rolling, the market's going to fall back. Um, are we breaking out into a long-term uptrend? Man, I, I just don't think so, given the fact we're talking about false efforts on the part of the Bank of China just to stimulate an already dead economy. Well, how do you bring a, something that's dead back to life if only but temporary, right? Because these are not quite dead yet, right? It's like the person they threw on the, uh, on the, on the wheelbarrow <laughs> in, uh, um, in uh, Monty Python, the Holy Grail. I'm not dead yet. Yes, but you're dying. You will be dead soon. This is the Chinese economy, right? The way that they're approaching things, the top-down effect. Certainly people here in the United States and a lot of Western countries envy their ability to just create growth out of nowhere. But the reality is it's a false sense of growth. It's just like looking at the S&P 500 and realizing that once you account for the weakness in the dollar, because the S&P is just a pairs trade, right? Of the, w, of the S&P that is, again, against the dollar because this is the price in dollars, you realize... It's a losing game so far to buy the S&P as a whole over the last almost 30 years. Okay. We need to find opportunities to create value. And in this kind of market, again, we're just at a critical point right now 
where the economy's turning a little bit, we're weakening. Uh, China's already weakened substantially. This is one of their third or fourth, fifth or sixth efforts just to try to lift it. They bring out the bazooka and all of a sudden you have U.S. investors, uh, big institutional investors scrambling to own China and with no protection saying the valuations, the protection, yet they don't have the same reporting requirements that we have in the United States. They don't have gap in the same, the same fashion that we have gap. And so how do you trust it? Again, do we believe in the idea that if you print money out of thin air, that this creates real value, creates real economic activity? All that it's likely to generate is temporary relief in the equity markets. As shorts get squeezed, the market goes higher. And you can talk about valuations all you want, but valuations are based on what? Past, but also future expected growth. And we're not going to likely yield the growth that's there. But here's the deal, though. Again, in these products, you can speculate the rising vol structure. You can take limited risk trades, buy the lower strike, sell the higher strike, buy the lower strike, sell the higher strike. Keep it two, three, four, five dollars wide if you want, depending on the amount of time you're choosing. You have a chance to create trades that have very limited risk, high reward, but low probability. If it comes crashing down, who cares? You lost it all. But if we get momentum and we continue to see the movement and these things push in the money, roll them, roll them, roll them until eventually we'll see it come down again. But I'm not one that buys into this optimism that printing money creates real growth and real wealth and creates the mirage of such. But to be honest, this last week's been pretty dang good if you're riding the Chinese stocks. And again, you just a matter of how you want to do it and how you want to play it. And so again, using call, out of the money call vertical spreads allows you to do that with skew in your favor, limited risk, low risk, high reward, low probability though. But again, you buy a 40 Delta-ish, decent chance that goes in the money. But again, we are overextended. Probably look for this thing to retrace just a little bit. But who knows? I and mean, we could easily just pick right back up again and rally because this is the way the market is geared. We're looking for something anywhere just to help create lift. And as we look at the S&P today, we saw that going into the close. I'm one that says, look, right now as we look at the volatility markets, look at the VIX. The VIX, this, the door shut a little bit on this, but the VIX itself isn't as important as the term structure of volatility so the VIX is still above 15, but earlier in the week, we saw that the three-month volatility was 20% higher, over 20% higher than the 30-day VIX. If we look at SKU, going into Friday's close, ticked up to 160, okay? The SKU is near record highs. We're still pricing in significant tail risk. If we look at the SPX, and we'll look at it for the next quarter, so let's see if we got it. <clears throat> What are expirations are in here? And we'll look at the expected move here, but uh, it's a 15. No, let's just expand this out. Let's go out to December 31st. What is the expected move? $400. Okay. So today the S&P is up 0.4%. In the last 12 weeks, we're up 0.72%. Uh, the top performing sector in the last 12 weeks is uh, as materials, of which gold is gold stocks are part of that, other metal stocks, et cetera. Again, 2%. Well, guess what? If we look at it December 31st, again, $441. What percentage is that on 562? So we take 441 divided by 5762. We're looking at 7.6% movement, expected movement in the next, what, three months. That's pretty a decent amount of volatility for that amount of time. That's just one standard deviation. And so, yes, is this saying that 6,000 is not is in sight? Yeah, that's within the one standard deviation by the end of the year. But guess what? So is what, 5,200-ish is also in the same one standard deviation range. And guess what? The volatility markets, due to high back month volatility relative to the 30-day spot, looking at skew, we're pricing in a 5 to 10% correction. We've already rallied off of our lows here about 7%. Are you going to get 10%, 11%, 12% before we see some degree of correction? I think that's the long shot. That's the long shot here. Um, again, high skew means we'll grind it out to the upside until we eventually experience the tail risk. Maybe we can grind it out, 
but maybe this might be it as we see the weakness in Chinese stocks off of this open late day surge to finish at a new all time high close. This seems like a pretty good setup to see a bit of a correction going into the beginning of next month. And again, that's just a guess, right? That's just a guess. And so how do you deal with this? Is it reasonable to have a bullish Delta? Absolutely. It's a reasonable, it's reasonable to have a bullish Delta. It's just, you probably should be looking at taking profits into strength and looking at hedging some degree of downside risk. Because again, going back to skew at 160, this is one of the biggest pricing and tail risk we have ever seen. And we just came off a record high a little over a week ago. Be prepared for a bigger correction here. The internals, the, the nominal versus real return of the market, again, the real bull market is not there in once you strip out the effect of the dollar. If the dollar continues to strengthen, we might see some, some risk, or some uh, price get taken out of the market here. The weak dollar holding it up based in nominal terms, all of a sudden the dollar begins to strengthen. I just don't see a pathway where the market's going to continue to go up with a stronger dollar and weaker gold prices. It needs at this stage weak dollar policy in order to continue to propel it forward. And we're not, we'll have to see what the next quarter holds. So realize there's a decent amount of volatility on the table being priced in right now as volatility is remaining higher at that 15, 16 level. We know that there's a lot of events coming up over the course of the next three months. So be prepared, look for bullish trades, look for bearish trades uh, on the downside today. If we look at United airlines, for example, this sucker has been up huge. Finished lower today, 1.6%. Yes, there is earnings coming up in mid-December. Uh, but in UAL, this is an October expiration here, 18 days out. Uh, they're, um, look at the wrong X strike here. Let me see. Oh, sorry, December. Going out to December here. Uh, December expiration. This is in the money at 60. But this is some money flow coming and buying puts in UAL today. Blackstone, everyone's favorite uh, renter. Not... A uh, Blackstone here, we got uh, what? And this is a, man, I can't read my writing. <laughs> An October expiration. Oh, man, this is not this is not good. I mean, you can't read your own writing. But uh, but again, the, the 150 strike, they're buying the 150s, selling the 140s. Uh, they added, there's a little more in here, but that was about 27, 2800 contracts. Long put vertical being bought in BX here. Not a bad deal. One, 150, 140, bit of a lottery ticket. But man, that sucker goes down. Should perform relatively well. A little wider spreads in here. Uh, but again, plenty of liquidity or depth to this market. But again, buying the 150 at 32%, selling the 140 at 37. Sell the 148, sell the 147. You can sell anywhere along here buying the 150. You determine how much risk you want to take. 150 is not that far out of the money. We could reasonably see that rip lower in the money. We could see and easily see a 140 test um, uh, by a... Uh, uh, by by the October's expiration, probably give yourself a little bit more time here instead of October. November would give you a little more time in this. The spreads are, you know, again, plenty of depth. Spreads are a little wider there, though. Uh, what's another one here that's on the bearish side? Have another one somewhere. SMCI, BX. Uh, those are the two main ones that I wanted to go over today. But, uh, but again, there's stuff that's out there that's bullish. I mean, eBay today. Had some long call activity coming in uh, for this week at the 66 strike. So a bullish option to in Newmont, despite the pullback here, we saw today's kind of doji spinning top formation, a uh, bullish option activity, you say October 54 strike. So again, maybe some near term upside there. UPS, a uh, nice breakout in UPS retest bounce. And then another breakout break of resistance around this 134, 133 area, 134 area. Um, this was a, a four oct 140 strikes. We got a near term price here. So again, we could easily see some bullish pop. Oh, the other one was elf on the bearish side. Elf is a, a flag pattern here. We finished in the low of the session. Again, you start to get below 108, 10750. We're looking at downside breakout. Uh, but again, this was an oct 90. So this is out of the money, relatively short amount of time here, right? Uh, but you look at the 90 down here, you could easily construct an out-of-the-money spread of 109, 107, for example. Um, the vol skew is not as favorable in here for October. 18 days, probably come out to November here. You'll see more normal vol structure of rising voltage move out. Buy the 105, sell the 110, buy vertical. Cost you about $2, risk two to make three. And again, um, 
Uh, $90, the downside price target there on Elf. Um, so a number of the trades, Jinko Solar today as well. Long call activity. Uh, again, Chinese company. Can we see bigger upside here? Absolutely. It's a major breakout. Finish near the highs. So again, you can look at, you know, a, a Nove expiration. It's not super liquid in here, but uh, you see wide bid ask spreads. Probably more of a stock trade, um, but you'll see in here the $30 strike price. Uh, again, $30 is not super far away. But again, you could look at further continuation in Jinko Solar. You could look at uh, um, um, ICLN. You could look at TAN, for example. Um, you could look at FAN. Oh, not FAN, but TAN, I think. It's a solar, solar ETF. So you could look at solar stocks on the verge of breaking out or maybe continued upside here. Um, but again, you know, Jinko Solar is, again, a Chinese company dovetail with the kind of that clean energy stuff so we could see some movement that's what we're looking at on neo two weeks ago week and a half ago as we're trading in the flag pattern here looking for a breakout so again we might see continued movement in some of those areas anyway folks wrap it up there but again just recognize some of the risks that we have to the market currently understand that look i mean we may go higher but the downside risks have almost never been higher as we approach an election season which is could be create a lot of volatility and uncertainty, a lot of geopolitical risk going on. And boy, we look at oil right now and, and oil's down and we have low supplies. Just makes you wonder, I mean, is this a powder keg that's ready to just, just explode to the upside? Um, we'll have to see. But again, we'll look for opportunities in, in oil as well going forward, bullishly or bearishly as we test support at 67.50. Anyway, that's a wrap on the video. We'll see you back.